And welcome, friends, to this, the Thursday morning edition of the Grace Hour. Again, we're broadcasting live from our studios, which are located at the home, the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore, Maryland. And welcome to this morning's broadcast, friends. Thanks so much for joining us. We do want to remind you at the outset of our broadcast today not to forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. And a quick reminder, of course, that we'll be broadcasting live today. And one more broadcast coming up on the Friday edition of the Grace Hour. Be sure to tune in as we wrap up this week's theme on the Friday edition of the Grace Hour. And our theme this week is loving God and loving our neighbor. And yesterday's broadcast and, of course, throughout the week, we have been reiterating just who is our neighbor. And that is anyone who is right in front of us, in our proximity, in our sphere of influence, people that we live with, people that uh, we go to school with, people that we work with, people in our neighborhood where we live. Again, um, Jesus has given us this great love and compassion for everyone. And we'll be talking about that today and developing it together with you, our listeners, The chat is available for you to share your comments and to ask your questions. We hope that many of you will do that. Uh, My name is Pastor John Love. Joining me in the studio today is Pastor Tom Schaller. And uh, we've been been given this assignment today, loving God, loving our neighbor, and exactly just what that means. And Pastor Schaller, we were speaking before the broadcast today talking about how we're living in a time and living in a culture where by and large, people are self-absorbed, perhaps now so more like at any other time in the history of our nation. And how can we break out of that me-first mentality where we can start to look upon the needs of others rather than focusing so often as we do on ourselves? Mm, um, I think both things happen. One is we do turn inward, and the other one is we go outward. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of nice people that we live with um, in the world, in our neighborhoods. There are a lot of people that make things happen and serve and actually care about you. Like the your mechanic, your car mechanic, does care about his living and him giving a, getting a decent wage, and then he cares about you and your car working. Um, a nurse cares about her, herself and her job, and then she cares about her service. And, of course, um, th- this is social and psychological, but where we're coming from is spiritual, the new birth, the regenerated nature of Christ being born in us, the gift of regeneration, and the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we have found that to be like not a, not a, you know, it, it's the ultimate. You know, to be a good person is one thing, and that's, that's, that's fine. That's civil, civility. But to be born again and to have a resource for this love. Because when you, the problem I feel in, in general with people is that we can get along, and as long as you treat me well, I'll treat you well. The problem comes when you mistreat me, and what do I do with that? Well, without the resources from God and the grace of God, the Spirit of God in me, and the doctrine that teaches me forgiveness, patience, um, love, investment, these are all things we learned in our church, in, in church life that have transformed our relationships and taught us what it means to love. So that's kind of like the ground for our program today. Yeah. and For this week. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good ground, too, because these without these things, as you mentioned, it's just, I, I can imagine people would be alienated from each other without God, without his grace, without forgiveness, without mercy, without overlooking people's faults and seeing what their real needs are and then trying to meet those needs. Yeah, we assume that people love, but actually what happens mentally, and when we talk about love, we're talking about a mental attitude. Uh, Can I project on my neighbor the best possible scenario? 
when they offend me, can I believe that, well, they did that, but they maybe they don't really know what they're doing. Um, maybe my neighbor is having a hard time in his own life and he needs, uh, maybe I can help him. I mean, do we have, uh, um, do we understand what love is? Love, love is, you know, he, Jesus said, you know, evil men, they give gifts to their children. In other words, evil men, they love their children. And there is love that is natural. But this is agape love. This is another love. And this is what Jesus meant when he said that we are to love our neighbor. So there's a lot to say about it. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's, it sounds strange that something that came to my mind is um, when I look back and look at the teams that we rooted and cheered for over the years. I remember one time in particular when our favorite baseball team was in the World Series and they lost. And and all I could think about was, oh, that guy, you know, oh, he he's so was bad. It, was that when the ball went between the legs uh, of uh, the first yeah, baseman? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yes, it was. Was it Buckner? Or yeah, was Bill this? Buckner yeah. Uh, with the Boston Red Sox at the 1986 <laughs> World Series. <laughs> I know so little about baseball, but, <laughs> but I you know to about know this. That. Yeah. Um, but I remember, you know, thinking of, oh, this pitcher, he's terrible, this this manager. I found out years later what these men were going through. The pitcher uh, who kind of blew the game, the mm. biggest game of his career and for the Red Sox fans, his son was dying of cancer in the hospital. The manager, his daughter, someone broke into their, his daughter and her husband's home in California and, and, and shot and killed his daughter. Oh. I'm finding out all of this like years later and thinking to myself, I was so angry with these people. I was so mad at them, but I had no idea... Yeah. the things that they were going through at that time. Mm. Um, what does it take to give us that kind of understanding and that kind of compassion for people? I guess we could say like Jesus when he's on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But mm. it sure seemed like they knew exactly what yeah. they were doing. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, how do we get right. that heart for yeah. people like God has. Well, uh, Pastor Love, if you think of 1 Corinthians 13, and um, maybe you want to read uh, verse 4 for me. Um, actually, I have it here in the Amplified. Maybe I, I should do that. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. So we're talking about loving our neighbor. Love is kind and th thoughtful is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not provoked, nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. So if we, we understand that this mentality it is a a real thing when when it is offended you know again let me repeat i think we're very skillful at keeping our neighbors like everybody's kind of like we're all civil and we're saying nice things and everything. but what are you thinking in your heart in your house about your neighbor what are you saying to your wife are you reiterating wrongs are you focusing on, are you imagining evil that's down the street, imagining that somebody has a selfish motive and what they're doing is, um, you know, deliberate or... So th this is, you know, I have a, a paper here. Evil thinking has no peace. It broods over assumed faults of others. It comes from a morbid imagination or a jealous heart. There is no peace to him who indulges in evil thinking. Hmm. Thinking over personal injuries, whether real or imaginary, is evil. In our world, men will be wronged, but why should we double the evil by dwelling upon it, pouring over it, and talking about it? What is the use? None at all. It spoils our peace and the peace of many others that are poisoned by its influence. 
Mm. Yeah. It's a power. And, and when you read First Corinthians chapter 13, it, it, it's not included in the Bible so that we can have a good technical, theoretical understanding of love. If this love is not actual, working. practical, working yeah. in our relationships with other people, it, it, it makes no sense. Yeah. This is all about living in the context of with other people and what's involved in that. And just to hear those, those thoughts about, uh, you know, thinking over personal injuries, whether real or imaginary, is evil. Why should we double the evil by dwelling upon it, pouring over it, talking about it? Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. But yes. yet we so often do that, mm -hmm. especially if we've been wounded, mm -hmm. because we want to talk about who wounded us and how they wounded us and how much it hurts us. And and then we, it, we, we just can explore that, it seems like, forever. Instead of living in forgiveness, instead of living with an attitude that says, look, God could do the same thing about me, mm -hmm. but he has given me grace. Mm -hmm. Now I have a capacity to give others that same grace. Mm, very good. You know, uh, we have a, a fragmented society, so we put people in categories like who... Um, who did you did you have a good bracket for the uh, March Madness? Uh, no, I, I don't even try because uh, I'm so poor at it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done it, but my family does it. Uh -huh. But uh, fragmented society, you know, whether it's you're a liberal or conservative, whether you vote for this person or that, whether you are gay or or transgender or whether you are friendly or poor or rich, educated or not, we are living in a world with human beings. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think that when you in your heart love and you learn what love is, that God is love. God has this world and he's loving it every day. And his mercies are new every morning. And he died for the sins of the whole world. And he's very patient right now with the world and all that, all of the messages in the world, all the things going on in the world, and in a way heartbroken. Mm -hmm. Not in a way, but profoundly, deeply. Well, God only knows what it is to bear the responsibility of the whole universe. But the uh, fact that he showed us love by giving his son to us, then telling us that we are to be here and to have the mind. Now, that in that love, there's not the compromise of truth. The truth is important. At the same time, how do you invest the truth in your neighbor? Can you open their heart? Can you... Pray for them. Do you actually love them or do you judge them? You know, ju judgment without mercy, and then we find judgment is really hard. But, but God is not judging us. He's giving us mercy, and mercy rejoices over judgment. Mm -hmm. So why not, like, learn to love and give grace and... Um, and think a certain way about the people that we live with. Let's talk about our neighbors for a minute. What venues were, were you would say, Pastor Love, where you would meet people in an elevator, in a garage, uh, parking lot, mm -hmm. in a school, university, classroom? Can you talk about that for a minute? Uh, those are just some of the, of the venues where we find people and again, to strike up a conversation. Um, for instance, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we were in an elevator at a parking garage in New York going in to uh, prepare to do the chapel service with the players, and we met the person who was going to be broadcasting the game. Um, his name was Kenny Albert, and he's a, you know, he's a broadcaster on a national scale, uh, hockey games, basketball games, football. He's very good, very talented. And we started to talk. He asked us why we're there. And, of course, we knew why he was there. Come to find out, he started right here in Baltimore. Oh. Uh, and he used to call the games for the uh, American Hockey League team that once was once here in Baltimore. 
and we struck up a conversation. And I think that that's, you know, it was good to do that because now we know him, he knows us, yeah. and there may be more opportunities down the road to, mm. you know, let him know about God's love. Yeah, being friendly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the air that can be between us as people, you know, that can be dispelled by your friendliness and kindness. But then, of course, uh, there are people more introverted or not skilled in conversation with strangers, and they don't feel comfortable, mm-hmm. and it's awkward. And But that that's not our point. I think our point is love in the heart. Yeah. I mean, have you ever sat in an airport watching people? Yes, yes. And do you love them? Yeah, and you want to talk to them. Yeah, right. And, and I think one of the first things we do sometimes when we're on an airplane... Well, David Shambowski does talk to him. <laughs> yes. So go ahead. But we're on that aircraft and we, you know, we're, we get our assigned seat. I think the first thing that comes to our mind is what kind of conversation can I have or will I have with the person who is seated beside me? Yeah. Will they want to talk? Yeah. And if they do, um, can I lead that conversation in a direction where eventually we talk about something that's real, the reality mm-hmm. of God, our soul's uh, life itself. Mm-hmm. I, I like looking at people, watching them, and thinking the best about them. Mm-hmm. Like, that's that's nice. I mean, there, are there criminals? Are there bad people? Yeah, but uh, you don't think evil, it says, 1 Corinthians 13. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we kind of put on... You know, isn't that, like I have a little phrase that we, we say in our, that's very cute, like some elderly person doing something and they're, they're very cute, or uh, some young person making their way in an airport and that kind of thing. Yeah. But now in the, in the scripture, there is that story where Jesus talked about the man who was beaten and left for dead, and then the good Samaritan came. And he talks that when he answers, who is my neighbor? They, they, they ask Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And then he tells that story. Mm. Uh, so w- could you, would you take that story apart a little bit just by your memory? Yeah, well, we, we, we mentioned it yesterday. We talked about it a little bit, and... The whole premise was this was a man who came to Jesus, and his goal, his objective, was to justify himself. Yeah. Right? Right, 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 right. away, you know, you have yeah. Jesus dealing with someone who's seeking self-justification, perhaps through his own efforts, mm-hmm. and then even, you know, asking the question, well, who is my neighbor? Mm-hmm. And do I really have a responsibility to read? And then Jesus tells, of course, that, that story, which is fascinating. And we mentioned yesterday in the broadcast how the word good is not even found in the story because, as we know, the Samaritans, there were no good Samaritans as far as the Jews were concerned. They were all bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the Samaritans thought the same way about the Jews. But, you know, Jesus, he painted that picture in such a way that I've said that the real person in that story that we can all identify with was the man who was left half dead because he couldn't do anything for himself. Mm -hmm. He had to rely upon the grace of others. Wow. And of course that happened with the Samaritan. But -hmm. of all people that Jesus could use as an illustration of a person who is kind, merciful, caring, he's a Samaritan. Yeah, right. (laughs) He chooses a loser, so to speak, in his story uh, to try to illustrate. Or that that one that completely contradicts, you know, uh, us. Yeah. Let's say... A communist, you know. Yes. The good communist, the, the <laughs> communist, or the Nazi, sorry yes. to say, to give them any credit as a party, no. Right. Absolutely no. We, we, it's evil. At the same time, somebody caught up in Nazism, unfortunately, I don't know, I don't want to push the point too much, but mm-hmm. it's shocking to think that a guy that totally is is on the other side of an of an issue could be uh good like that i know yeah yeah it's amazing yeah and i think that the story it brings out the fact that really what what is it that we need but we need mercy we need it and what is it that god is looking for us to give to others is mercy and you know mercy is i mean is when god exercises his mercy doesn't he look at the human race with this great sense of pity 
and he sees them mm. as people that, like sheep that have gone astray and that they don't really know what they're doing. So he does everything in his heart of mercy to find them, mm -hmm. to win them. And I like what you said a, a few moments ago, how can we find a way to open people's hearts? I remember hearing Pastor Stevens years ago saying that there is a key to everybody's heart. You just have to find out which key fits mm -hmm. and works, and then you have your opportunity to share the gospel. Oh, yeah, beautiful, yes. So it, that might take yes. some effort on our part, right? Sure, because as sure. you said earlier, it, the easiest thing for us to do is to label people. Yeah. The challenging thing is to love people. There's the love. That's Labeling good. is real easy, you know? Now, what about a person very close to you? Uh, and I want to give an example here. Um, our, our spouses, okay, our wife, our hu husband, mm -hmm. um, also cl people close, cousins, uncles, aunts, sisters, brothers, people that are close. This is where a lot of damage is done because there isn't love. Right. There, there is uh, that, that human love, and then there is like expectations and disappointments mm. and hurts and pains and offenses and everything. But I want to read this. Um, it says, um, some people dwell upon others' faults. Mm -hmm. Think of a husband who is forever pouring over the faults of his wife and who has no heart to notice her excellencies. Mm. Wow. Huh? Yeah, you what can you see think? how that can happen. How about, we will change it up a little. Think of a, a wife mm -hmm. who is forever pouring over the faults of his, of her husband and has no heart to notice his excellencies. Mm. And isn't that the challenge in, in close relationships, in marriage, mm -hmm. that, that you would, because you can become so familiar with them mm -hmm. and you, you see the faults every day, you see the shortcomings, you see the little, little idiosyncrasies that can mount up after time, yeah. um, you know, it, without the love of God in in that relationship, how could, how could it go on? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I we, think that we, we see it today in our culture. We are good at picking each other apart. Oh, yeah. We are good. Experts. Just, huh? Yeah, we're experts. Just like the skin cancer doctor. He'll just pick <laughs> you apart. <laughs> oh, Lord. What? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he, he's looking for that one thing. Well, haven't you noticed my beautiful face? <laughs> can't you no, find something I, good? I got something. I can see something. You can't see it. I can see it. And I'm going to deal with that thing. Now, <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> oh. So, I mean, honestly... You got you to gotta look at the end game. Where does love take us? Not only in regards to like what, what love does when, when I am loving what it does for me. I, I honestly believe, I believe C.S. Lewis wrote this. Um, he said, you know, if you start doing bad things, the bad things, they, they affect you and you become bad and then you you will become you become bad, and then you will even get worse. Mm -hmm. But if you do good things and you start doing good things, you'll actually become good. Mm -hmm. Now that maybe sounds a bit humanistic, but if you put in there the regenerated nature of man, mm -hmm. and you just say, "I, I want to walk in the spirit. I want to love." Mm -hmm then you will find yourself loving. That's right. You will, you will actually find yourself loving. And like we said last night with David killing Goliath, he's like, I don't get it, you guys. This guy, I can take this guy down. I don't get it. What's the problem? What's your problem? Like, he's not in that. It's amazing the mm -hmm. difference between a loving person and where love takes them as a person and where we're really not loving brings me to hatred. Mm. And I'll give it focused on that thing that is bugging me and I cannot get rid of it because I don't love. Wow. That happens. Yeah. And you can see how that would be a pattern that is developed in a person's soul. And I think it goes back to what you shared earlier about the practical decisions that we make, for instance, to come to church on a regular basis yeah. so that we can hear that. 
yeah. over and over again. And our souls can be conditioned to love people that have faults and that experience failure and, and might have some problems in their life. We, 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 our souls are conditioned to love beyond that mm -hmm. and, and not because, well, again, it's, we, yes, we're regenerated, but that regenerated life needs to be fed on a consistent basis. It needs to grow. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and regular attendance at church and fellowshipping with spirit-filled believers and staying in the context of spirit-filled believers, that, that goes a long way to changing who we are. No, I, I want to digress just for a minute here and think about the popular psychology of the day. You know, people go to see psychologists, they have therapists, some of them are on medications, and they're dealing with anxieties and fears and so on. And I want to make a suggestion, and that is, uh, that is it's something new. I mean, it's beautiful. It's not new. It's biblical. Mm -hmm. But love, 1 Corinthians 13, love, is a way of healing. It's a way of, like, developing and maturing. Last night was a very good message about, about dealing with being offended and forgiving. And when, when you are living in this love where you are forgiving and then forgiving and forgiving, you will spiritually grow. There will be an increase. But if you can't get over the offense and you get stuck there, you will not grow spiritually. Mm. You will not grow. Then you will explore what's wrong with you. You will explore, you will look for answers, and, and some of them are not good. Mm -hmm. I have a short list here. Uh, people, number one, focus on themselves. Like, that's not a good habit, focusing on yourself. Like, grow up, live in love, be lighthearted, be thankful, love God, love serve others, be ministered unto and minister to others. But they have an absorption on themselves. They absor absorb, occupied with themselves and very un sometimes very undisciplined. Mm -hmm. Number two, they focus on childhood trauma. Childhood trauma is not denying it, but to go to my past regarding my future is, you know, questionable. And I'm not a professional speaking about it that way, but I am a pastor, and I have a lot of experience with people. And I have said, I have met people who have had childhood trauma, but they get beyond it, and they kind of forget about it. Mm -hmm. It's not where they're living. They kind of give in, they live in love. Not rehearsing trauma, but rehearsing forgiveness, rehearsing love, rehearsing faith, and then they get outside of themselves because this is a, a way, it's a mentality in our, in our world today. Mm -hmm. These things that people are absorbed with themselves, they are going into the past. Number three, they live with wounded feelings. Their feelings are wounded and they are not healed. It's like in Jeremiah. Number four, they have emotional cravings. They live in their emotions and their feelings. They can fall in love with somebody else that they shouldn't be in love with. They can um, they crave. They have emotional cravings and desires, ambitions. They're restless mm -hmm. in many areas of life. Okay, all right, fine. I'm emotional, but but I I think that the ability to be patient to be kind, to be sober-minded, mm -hmm. to deny myself an emotional craving, to re put it in its place, to uh, relate to it through this kind of love that we're talking about, agape love, mm -hmm. will bring me, bring me to progress, spiritual progress, mm -hmm. and I'll have authority over my emotional cravings. Mm -hmm. I'll be able to have a disciplined life, yeah. you know? It's a disciplined life. That where that come from? It's from God. It's from His love. You have a disciplined life. Yeah. You're able to deny yourself. And then, lastly, um, 
we have egocentric sources, egocentric sources. Like, I will talk to somebody who will, who will compliment my ego, but I will not to talk to somebody who will challenge me in my ego. I, I don't want to be humiliated. I don't want to be put down in a, in a I don't want to be um, corrected. I want my way. I don't want any authority in my life. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. That's not love. Okay, love will change my life. That's, okay. Uh, wow. Huh? Those are powerful, powerful thoughts. And, and just to focus on one of them, the childhood trauma, and, and not to downplay it. And we realize that some people have experienced that. But what can you do about it right. once it has happened? Mm -hmm. what, I mean, what, what are your options? Well, we're not denying a process or healing. We're not denying the reality of it. We're mm -hmm. not Like I have a friend who has a post-traumatic uh, from the war, mm -hmm. and it's a very real thing, and it's a, a powerful thing in his life, and he's working. So we don't deny. Mm -hmm. We're just saying that love never fails. That's, That's right. what it says in the scripture. Right. We're saying God is love, and we're saying if God is in my life, I want to walk with God, and I don't want my life hijacked in a humanistic direction where I can't get out of myself. Mm. I'm in my self-life continually. And even in the world, there are people that say, okay, I'm done with this thing. I want to move on. Mm. Of course. Yeah, you have to at yeah. some point. Yeah. Otherwise, whatever has happened in your past, uh, it controls you for the rest of your life. Yeah. You carry it around like a ball and chain. Mm. And, and you're never liberated, you're never set free, you never have any peace. God offers freedom. He offers peace. He offers healing. You know, um, of course, I want to say, with, with, I don't want to, I'm not hammering psychology, okay, but I, uh, I'm i sure there's amazing counselors that are very good at helping people. Mm -hmm. But I am I am saying in our culture, uh, it's very popular for people to go to uh, talk about their self-life and never get led on into what they really need. And that's uh, that relationship with God, which we all are look. We all, I, I, we're not saying we have arrived, mm -hmm. but we have tasted it, exactly. and we want it, and we're going in that direction. We just want to bring others with us, Amen, and love our neighbor. Yes, you know, yes. love our neighbor, love people, live in a life of of grace, and in our families, kind of get over it and kind of start loving family members. Even if they've offended you, even if they're uh, strange from you, mm -hmm. and by whatever means, you you have your convictions about things, but you also are are learning how to process their lives in your heart and in your mind, so that you're able to uh, uh, hopefully open their hearts. Yeah, and we we understand <laughs> the problem with with people that are caught up in that is that self can't help self. <laughs> I know yeah. that self-help is a, is a huge, multi-billion-dollar business today. Of course, yeah. I mean, you yeah, go yeah. into bookstores, and the yeah. self-help portion of the bookstore is enormous. Yeah, and there's been uh, hundreds and thousands of volumes written on it. But how come nobody gets help? Why yeah. do you have to keep writing more books about it? I know, I know, I know. Self well, can't help self. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I can't help but think about the people that are tough. My my best teacher in my life, maybe in one one way of evaluating, was a sixth grade teacher, Mr. Forbes. He was he was tough guy. I was twelve years old. I went in that class very respectful, and he was sitting at his desk, quiet. Everyone, 12 year old boys and girls, you could hear a pin drop. Mm. The guy had so much authority <laughs> over that classroom. <laughs> we were scared to death of that guy. Mm -hmm. And we did our homework, we did everything. You know, we were obedient. It was like good. Now, I don't know how teaching is going today. But by what we know, generally, things are falling apart. Yeah. And, like, who is good at it? Mm. 
the guy that's going to make, you know, throw me candy bars, the guy that's going to make me sit up straight, you know. Who is good at it? The guy that's going to, like, give me a pass and I can goof around and be an idiot or the guy that's going to make me somebody, you know. It's the same in coaching, basketball, who's going to win? Mm -hmm. Who's going to make a man out of a boy uh, into a man? Who's going to make a, a man into a Christian man? And a, and a good father and a good mother and so on. It's got, I, got, I need that in my life. So I need a pulpit. Yeah. I need the spirit of God to be my teacher. I need God's brother, my brothers and my sisters to be real with me. And that is love. That's yeah. like what we call it, right? A tough tough love. love. Yeah. That is love. But we're also talking about, you know, like where is it coming from? It's like somebody that does really love me mm -hmm. will be firm with me. Yeah. They'll tell you the truth. And that's why we, we need truth tellers in our lives. And hopefully the, the most important truth teller uh, that we have, of course, is, is God. But then practically speaking, it can be our local church. It can be the pastor teacher that has the courage enough to, you know, cry aloud and spare not. Yeah, and I have the, the willingness to go there. Mm -hmm. Just like, does an Olympian, uh, ice skating champion, does he want to go to the gym at four in the morning? Mm -hmm. Does he want to get up? Does he like uh, Jeff Phelps? Did you see the breakfast that he ate over here in Baltimore when he was training for the mm -hmm. Olympics? Mm -hmm. There was an article on it, you know. Wow. He burned so many calories in a mm -hmm. workout. You know, wow. That, how many gold medals? 48 gold yeah. medals more or something? Anyone. More than anyone. What an incredible story. But, I mean, uh, he, did, he got it. He got the focus and he did it. Well, I, I, we can be sure that it wasn't, I don't know if people relate to this illustration, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you're athletic and well, you I have do that the hard in my things. background. I don't know, I, but I think there's a lot of people on the couch that might be listening to us and saying, I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do the hard what? things in life. I don't know. <laughs> you have to. I mean, well, uh, you know, a, a life of ease and comfort uh, does not produce character in a person's soul. Yeah, you got to do you got to do the hard okay. things. Okay, let's say I, I'm overweight, but you can be disciplined. That's okay. You're overweight, but you can be disciplined as you're overweight. Okay, yeah. and the, and probably you know you'll get a grip on that thing. Mm. Whatever, it, I don't care. M for us, maybe our academic disciplines we need. Uh, uh, and mo most importantly, that processing of life the right way so that we end up giving grace and loving people. Yeah. But when you, when you live in a world where, where people are telling you all of the time, uh, love yourself, uh, be yourself, yeah, right. enjoy yourself, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you hear Jesus say, how about this one? Deny yourself. Yeah. I mean, that just... It it's like you're going against the tide of popular opinion in the culture. Yeah. But yet Jesus, he knows better than anybody knows what's good for us, what's going to develop us, what's going to make us the kind of people that really deep in our hearts we would like to be. And it might mean more self-denial than anything else mm -hmm. about what we want to do for self. And, and the good news is he's saying it. It's not just a slogan on a... On a you know, on a wall, mm -hmm. is the authority of God, deny yourself and you will find your life. Wow. We wouldn't have a message if we didn't, he didn't say that. That's right. We say you deny yourself with Jesus Christ and you will spiritually be growing. Yeah. And when you grow, there's nothing like it. Yeah. It's the sweetest, best thing in life that you'll be capable of taking down Goliath. Yeah. Like Amen. we said last night. Right. Yeah. And and it, as we close the broadcast today, Pastor Scheller, maybe we can just uh, answer this qu final question. Can I love God with all my heart and not show it to my neighbor? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, you it's a thing in the heart. Let's say I never go out of my house. I'm disabled. I'm in bed in my house, and my neighbor doesn't even know me. Um, I love them in my heart. And I, that's where it all matters, really. But then 
probably there'll be an opportunity where I can send a little, little letter to my neighbor to tell them, you know, thank you for being a nice neighbor or something like that. So mm. I don't know if I got that right. No, no. I, I, Was I think that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think. I, I don't show it, but but I have it in my heart. Yeah. And yeah. maybe there'll be an opportunity where it'll come out of Yeah. Me. And as we, we mentioned yesterday in the broadcast, that's what it comes down to, opportunity. Uh, Paul wrote to the Galatians, says, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, mm-hmm. especially those in the household of God. And you know, uh, you could write a letter to your senator if he's fighting a good fight of faith, if he's caring about the state of Maryland, if he cares about the government, if he's doing a good job. I mean, that's an expression of love, mm. you know, to, mm. to a congressman who's doing a good job representing your values, mm. um, uh, the mayor of a city, the governor of a state. You can do it to, um, you know, people that you know personally, your neighbors, or neighbors relatives. Uh, yes, you can express that love. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a good question to, to close the broadcast with is that if we all asked ourselves this or in, in terms of speaking to someone else, um, you know, what can I appreciate about you? Whether yeah. it's a spouse, yeah. a child, right. a politician that represents right. us, right. a pastor, a teacher, yes. a friend. Yes. Um, you know, what, what is it that I can appreciate about you? And then tell them. Yeah, be- beautiful. Communicate. Yes, it. amen. There is something. Yeah. You know, you are made in the image of God. <laughs> yeah. Because That's the, the a bad baseline yeah. right there. There you go. But the you're, other option you're alive. is you're the other the, only, the other option question is, you know, can I what let me tell you the one thing that really bothers me about you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which would be so easy to do. Yeah. Which is right. why we're talking about today. You know, you do the hard things. Yeah. What is it about you that I can appreciate? Mm-hmm. And and then tell tell somebody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, we've reached the end of today's broadcast, friends, but thanks so much for joining us. Um, some practical principles to perhaps implement into our lives as God leads us. But uh, we're regenerated. We're born again. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Um, clearly, if anyone has a, a right to look on the bright side of life, it's you and I as born again believers. Thanks so much for joining us. And of course, one more broadcast coming up on the Friday edition of the Grace Hour. Tune in then, friends. Until then, may God bless you.